when this guitar came out, they called it the fastest guitar because of where the neck hit the body. It was supposed to be Gibson's saving grace from all those failed designs. You know, like the Les Paul, the Explorer, the Flying V, and in 1961, Gibson officially introduced the SG guitar. The truth is it wasn't really the SG guitar in 1961, it was the Les Paul Custom. We'll get into it. But first I wanna say, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy belated Thanksgiving, whatever it may be to you. I appreciate you guys, I'm thankful for you guys, and I'm looking forward to doing this a whole lot more in 2024. I hope you'll continue to spread the word and let people know that this is a place that they can come where we can all talk about guitars and nerd out, free from all the insanity out there in the real world. But here, in this little space, we're safe. I knew I had two guitars coming because Ben Ash, I think he actually might be sick of me just being like, Ben, what am I getting next? What am I getting next? What am I getting next? Hey man, can you send me some guitars? How about I just shut you up, Benny? I'll send you this beautiful silver SG. Do you want it in silver or chair? Silver, please. He sends me not one, but two Gibsons. One of them being a Murphy Lab, and he didn't even tell me what it is. So I got the box. I have no idea. I wake up and my wife is like, you know that there's two giant Gibson boxes on our back porch. I didn't sign for those. A part of me wanted to be like, I didn't get them. That guy was really lucky because what was in those boxes, if someone had taken them, oh man, that would have been a really bad day for everybody. I opened the lighter one knowing it was probably the SG. The next one is a surprise, so stay tuned. Special thanks to Sam Ash for sending me both. Gotta tell you, Ben. I like what we got going here. I'm not saying that because I just bow to sponsors. Oh my God, this Canada Dry Blackberry Ginger Ale, it's just amazing. I wanted to know a little bit more about this guitar before, you know, we talk about this guitar. What's the deal with the SG? Let's clear the table right now. SG stands for solid guitar, which it certainly is. But to bring you guys up to speed, and namely around 1960, Les Pauls weren't doing so hot. <coughs> because between 1958 and 1960, they only sold 1,700 guitars. I ain't keeping the doors open at Gibson. Ted McCarty had sourced these amazing ideas for the Flying V and the Explorer. There's only 18 1958 Explorers. Only about 90 1959 Flying V or something like that. Cunningham's Law, someone's gonna be like, there's 103 and technically there's one in my grandfather's attic but nobody knows about it. That was from a guy named Dr. Wade Cunningham who said the best way to get the right information is by posting information that's incorrect. If I played Paganini's Fifth Caprice, I'd probably get three guys like cool. But if I said, hey man, the SG guitar stands for super good, oh man, would you guys be down my throat? Thankfully, when I mess things up, it gets me more views. So thank you, every troll. And not everybody who wants to correct me is a troll. In fact, I wanna say I love the fact when people have more information than me. I am not the end all be all. Anyone that knows anything about anything knows that there's always more to be learned. So if you know more about something than me, or if I missed something, or if I got an incorrect, just say, hey, Benny, that 498, it's an El Nico 5 magnet, not an El Nico 2. Things weren't so hot for the Gibson company with all their electric guitars. Namely with the Les Paul, it was only a single cutaway. They were getting beat up at Gibson about that. So of course, time for something new, Ted McCarty, went to Larry Allers and said, hey man, this is what everyone's been saying, make a guitar, please help us. And Larry came up with what we now know as the Gibson SG, which harkens to the absolutely beautiful double 12, very early Gibson history, which later turned into the EDS 1275. As you can see, very similar in shape. Recognize anything? So Larry Allers came up with this idea, which is a pretty incredible guitar, despite the fact that everyone believes that it drove Les Paul away from Gibson. We'll get into that in a second, but there's some real distinct differences from the Les Paul that wasn't selling and this Gibson SG shape, which is the fact that first off, it is a double Florentine cutaway. Secondly, the Gibson Les Paul hits the body around the 16th, 17th fret, where this is the 22nd fret. Hence the name, the fastest guitar, because you could hit every single fret and it was completely unfettered access to the high notes. And the SG is only one and three eighths thick, whereas the Gibson Les Paul is two and three eighths thick. 
You have a guitar that's lighter, you have a guitar that's thinner, you have a guitar that's easier and less expensive to produce in a time when Gibson wasn't doing too well. This is a 6.8 pound guitar, whereas most of my Les Pauls are between eight and 12 pounds. Eight being light. I pray for the eight pound Les Pauls. And with this design, as we say in Boston, the humbuckers are closer to the bridge, which kind of gives you a brighter sound. Basically, a nice solid piece of mahogany without that cap of maple. Solid mahogany tone machines, as I like to call them. And then you got the double cutaway so you can just grab it nice and easy. Made for metal in 1961. By late 1959, the Les Paul Special and the Les Paul TV turned into the SG Special and the SG TV. Showing up before even the end of the run of 1960 Les Pauls came the 1961 Les Pauls, which were this shape. They had Les Paul on the truss rod. The SG was officially known as the Les Paul or the new Les Paul. A lot of people believe that because Les Paul had nothing to do with this design, that he hated the guitar, it looked like devil horns, it was neck heavy, all kinds of stuff. So first off, Les Paul didn't have a ton to do with the original Les Paul design. That was a Ted McCarty thing. And secondly, Les Paul was famous for embellishing upon things, giving misinformation. The truth is Les Paul had no problem with his guitar at all. He was going through a divorce with Mary Ford. He didn't want to give her any more money. It was that simple. The other thing was he was going through a terrible time in his life. He was super bummed out. He said, you know what, Gibson, it's been real. Thank you, I'm gonna go my way. And they let him go, it was kind of a mutual thing. All the stuff that you guys hear about Les Paul really hating this guitar, he just made that up. I seen the document in Les Paul's handwriting that I showed to Barry Goudreau from Boston and Pat Badger from Extreme in a previous episode called The House That Les Built Part Two. That document is now with Mark Ignacy and my friend Matt Kaler at Gibson. So I'm sure you're gonna hear a whole lot more about it, but that's the truth. Les Paul had no problem with the guitar, was going through a whole to-do with his divorce and his life and depression and losing popularity. In 1968, Les Paul came back to Gibson and they started making the Les Paul again, yay! That's another episode. By 1960, they were making the Les Paul Custom and the Les Paul Standard looking like this till 63, when it officially became the SG. Are we all caught up? Does that make sense? Cool. Let's talk about this guitar. At the time of filming, this is a 1799 SG Standard, which by the way, go to the link in the description if you love this guitar. Let my friends at Sam Ash hook you up. It's there. So for 1800 bucks, what are we getting? What is now the SG Standard? A guitar that went through so many different iterations. I mean, you have like 15 different vibrola tailpiece things just to make it go like that. They were trying to do the thing that Fender did with the Stratocaster and it, it didn't work quite the same way. What really inspired Ted McCarty was Fender saying, hey, you guys are old fogies, you're fuddy-duddies, you don't know what's going on because Fender, when they came out with the Stratocaster, they did it right the first time. I mean, have you seen those early Stratocasters? They look exactly like what's out there now. Telecaster, perfect. Broadcaster, Esquire, great. Those were all great right from the beginning. Simple designs. With Gibson, look at those crazy trapeze tailpieces on those early 1952 Les Pauls. They went through so many different design changes and meanwhile, Fender's just doing their thing. Part of those design changes is what made so many different cool guitars and so many cool things along the way that didn't quite make it. Yeah, so did you read my message? No, I'm filming a video, I'm literally on camera. Okay, well, the uh, prime rib is like 60 to 80 bucks. Do you think we should just do like a fake flank or something? Yeah, that's fine, whatever. Okay, goodbye. Goodbye, love, love you. Okay. You have an absolutely beautiful silver sparkle finish with nitrocellulose, which is such a cool look because it lets the guitar as they say, breathe. You can kind of see the pores. It's much thinner than polyurethane, which will take better care of your guitar in the long run, but this is better for sound as far as letting the guitar resonate, as well as you're gonna get that beautiful checking over time with how the finish is gonna sit with the wood. You have a 490R and a 490T humbucker, which are essentially PAS with a modern twist with kind of an upper mid kind of boost to them. You have the three-way toggle, Les Paul style, along with two volumes, two tones with these beautiful top hat knobs. It's a 22 fret rosewood fretboard 
with a quirly trapezoid inlays and binding everywhere, as you can see. You got the Gibson logo and the crown in mother of pearl, which looks just beautiful against this all black headstock with SG right on the truss rod cover. To be noted, you have a Graph Tech nut, which they make some of the best nuts in the business. And that absolutely matters for how well it plays. You have Grover Rotomatic tuners, all chrome. You have the standard fair aluminum tunematic bridge with the chrome plating. When I think of SG, I think of Robbie Krieger from The Doors. I think of Tony Iommi, the father of metal from Black Sabbath. Eric Clapton, who played his first American show with The Fool, which was his 1964 SG, which sold for $1.27 million to Mr. Jim Ursay. How can you not associate the shape with ACDC? There are so many players that just embody this guitar. I didn't even say the fact that Pete Townsend used to break the crap out of these things. Frank Zappa, he had a crazy one that wasn't a Gibson, but 23 frets, because Frank was weird. I've spent the last 48 hours getting to be friends with this thing, and I gotta tell you, I really like it. Let's go see how it sounds. if I turn that up, right? has great intonation. It's funny because I did a Les Paul showdown the other day and the 490-498 combination of my Supreme was my least favorite of the three. I did like all three, the 57s, the Burst Bucker Pros, and the 490-498. The 490s in this just absolutely shine. I don't know if it has something to do with the fact that they're closer to the bridge, so you get a little bit more high end, which is the design on the SG we spoke about earlier, or the fact that it is just a Solid mahogany tone machine. There's no maple, it's nice and thin. It's a simple guitar. It's a solid guitar. It's a fast guitar. Thank you. 
I've been sitting here for like 40 minutes playing this thing, just having a blast. I love the nitro on this where you can see the beauty in the wood, a solid mahogany tone machine. It represents so much in the history of Gibson. It certainly has an unbelievably fast neck and just what an incredible guitar. If you want one, please go to the link in the description. It'll bring you right to Sam Ash. I know what I want for Christmas. It's in a Gibson box and it's from the Murphy Lab. Stay tuned. Happy holidays, guys. See you in 2024. Why don't you smash that subscribe button already?